Um, we have a big crowd tonight in. Um, obviously, the uh, lecture topic is of great interest to people. Um, and the um, Wolves in Ireland, based on the book of the same name by Karen Hickey, um, who's given a lecture tonight. Um, I suppose part of it is that, you know, um, we and Carlo at least claimed that the, the last wolf um, that was hunted down was hunted down in Mount Leinster by uh, John Watson of Ballydarton House. Um, and again, the Watsons of Ballydarton were Quakers. Uh, John, um, and I assume it's the same, John in 1808 um, was the inaugural master of the Carlo Hunt. And uh, the other a number of uh, notable Watsons, including Corrine North, uh, who's Original name was Karina Dean, Lecky Watson, who bequeathed Altamont House, that beautiful gardens out, um, Taurus Ballon, uh, to the state in 2004. Um, Kieran is um, he's an, 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 an interesting uh, bio. Uh, he's senior lecturer in geography in UCC and head of the Department of Geography and head of the School of Human Environment. Um, his interests include climate change, storms, hurricanes, um, and to this end, he's undertaken a lot of research projects on climate, climate history of Ireland, uh, specialising in changing patterns of storms, hurricanes, and climate change attributing uh, of extreme weather events. Um, he regularly appears on national radio and TV and print media on these expertise. Um, and he's published two books on climate change and obviously one on wolves, which is the topic tonight. Um, he's edited numerous journal articles. <coughs> so, Kieran. Um, with that, um, you're very welcome to our online lecture, sure. and I hand over to you to deal with the topic. Lovely. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the Carlow Historical and Archaeological Society for this invite. I really do enjoy and look forward to giving these types of events. I do about four or five a year, and they're really uh, one of the highlights of the year for me as well. It gets me away from the, the grind at the desk as such, although I'm sitting at my desk at home because of the circumstances. So what I want to do over the next uh, hour or so is basically talk about the story of wolves in Ireland and give you kind of a flavour of the different types of evidence that, that we have that I've spent the last basically 20 to 30 years digging on and will probably still be digging at by the time I finish up uh, down the line a couple of decades from now. So working very hard still on this and still trying to develop it further. And every now and again, I get a new little snippet of information. So it's an ongoing project of mine. So what I'm going to do is really run through quickly something like dimensions, the origin, where do wolves come from, where are they now, where were they in the past, and also for Ireland, what's the important context, and then in, in that context, look at a whole series of evidence, archaeological, name evidence, folklore evidence, and more recently the documentary evidence. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how many wolves were there in Ireland and their cause of extermination, and obviously we have to finish on a controversial aspect, given the data in it. So we'll talk about reintroduction, briefly anyway. And I'll maybe draw some conclusions at the end, and then I'll leave it open to questions as well. Okay, so this is a, a typical picture of a wolf. In some respects, it's not, because the typical picture you often see in the media is a snarling, tooth-exposed wolf or wolf pack. And that's generally not the case, okay? This is an alpha male. This is photographed in Siberia. And you can see they're a very fine individual, very large head, very large feet. But it's hard to get an idea of the scale of a wolf. And one of the important things when you talk about wolves, although they superficially appear like domestic dogs and are genetically related, they are actually very different. And they are a genuine wild animal and a genuine wild predator. So just to put it in perspective, um, uh, typical body size, one to 1.4 meters with, a, with up to a half meter tail. Height at the shoulder, one to 1.5 meters. So a big wolf at the shoulder would be typically chest high for most Irish people, which is, as you can imagine, at the extreme end for a domestic dog. Large alpha males can weigh from 150 up to 200 pounds plus. And to put this in perspective, this is a picture of unfortunately it's exceptionally large alpha male that was shot in Siberia. The guy holding the wolf up is actually six foot four. Okay, so that'll give you an idea of the size of the wolf. And also I want to pay attention to the wolf's head, which you can see, you can see very clearly here. The wolf's head is about three or four times his size. And I can assure you he's a big man with a big head. So uh, a wolf is definitely not a domestic dog, although they are related. 
and we should always treat them as, as extreme wild animals. In addition, of course, wolves are not primarily solo operators. They're not like leopards or cheetahs. Um, they're very much more like lions in the sense that they operate in a pack. They're controlled by an alpha male and alpha female. And typical pack sizes can range from four or five individuals right up there. This is a super pack from Alaska. This pack actually has 20 plus adult wolves. Um, and these only occur, these huge super packs only occur, mega packs only occur where there's ample prey. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we have here is a classic example of a wolf pack moving off to hunt with the alpha male leading the organization. So the alpha male is actually leading the line here. And this would be a, a phenomenal and frightening appearance to anybody to see this scale of wolves moving along, which is me. The environment. Okay, so where do they come from? Well, the vast majority of wolves on planet Earth are, are this grey wolf or Canis lupus. Okay, and these are different names in different parts of the world. So they're often known as the Arctic wolf, the timber wolf, North American wolf, the Middle East wolf, uh, but they're actually all the same species. There are some subspecies aspects of them, but they're actually all the same species. And it's a fairly recent species. They only emerged probably around 700,000 to 1 million years ago. Um, uh, and probably from uh, either the Eurasian or North American species that I mentioned up there. The domestic dog is actually, the, chast the correct Latin name is Canis lupus familiaris. So it's the domestic gray wolf or domestic dog. And genetically they're 99.6% identical uh, and can interbreed, but that 0.4% is the difference between a wild animal and a domesticated species. So although it might seem very little, in reality, that's a critical 0.4%. Okay, so this is just a genetic tree of wolves. And for those of us who are, and I don't know how many people are Game of Thrones fans, uh, George R. R. Martin knew what he was doing because, of course, there were dire wolves. They did exist, believe it or not. They were a North American megafauna and they became extinct about 10,000 years ago, along with a lot of North American megafauna. And typically they'd be about 20% bigger than the modern gray wolf, okay? So dire wolves did actually exist. So he borrowed that from the literature, uh, George R. R. Martin. And in fact, in recent times, a number of coyote species, or at least they were taught by coyote species, including in Ethiopia, have actually been genetically identified as small wolves as opposed to coyotes and because of genetic evidence. So even the genetic story is still telling us new information and new, 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 um, new wolf species. So Ethiopia now has two wolf species as opposed to one wolf species. So what we have here is a very interesting diagram. So what you have in red and green, if you combine red and green, would be the distribution of wolves that you would expect without human interference. So they typically went from the northern fringes of the Arctic, well inside the Arctic Circle, from Greenland, all the way down in, well into Mexico. So they're very much a northern hemisphere species. And as you can see, they're widely distributed or were widely distributed. If you look at the Eurasian continent, you can see that all the way as far to Japan. In fact, there were two species of dwarf wolves in Japan allegedly still around but very difficult to identify because of course Japan is mostly high mountain very difficult to access. I've seen versions in the Japanese Natural History Museum in, in Tokyo but they covered all of virtually all of China, um, all of India, obviously all across Russia, into Europe, Middle East as you can see here and across North Africa as well. So the boundaries really are the tropical uh, forests or the deep deserts. That's really the boundaries of wolves in terms of their distribution. So once you get into this part of Southeast Asia, into the tropical rainforest, um, obviously you're into the, the Saudi deserts here, the Sahara, and again back into tropical rainforest. So that's the one thing that's paying them in. Apart from that, they're incredibly flexible. So if you look at them going from well inside the Arctic Circle to the extreme cold, minus 40 degrees centigrade to plus 40 degrees centigrade, in the Arabian Peninsula across North, North Africa 
and in parts of India and China as well. It shows their incredible adaptability and, and, and the incredible range that they can actually cover. And they're one of the most widespread mammal species of all time. What's left in green would be what the distribution of wolves have been about 2000 AD. So you can see they're pretty much exterminated from most of the North American uh, continent, especially the USA, the lower 49th. But they have been introduced since, so they are actually, would be a lot more green if I was bringing up to 2020, um, spreading down mostly the West Coast. They also were uh, common all across Europe, including Ireland, but you can see there are pockets of them still in uh, Northwestern Portugal and Spain, uh, the Apennines in Italy, and then you're into Eastern Europe and a few in Scandinavia. And the numbers are generally increasing under protection. So again, if I was to try and update this map, you'd see a little bit more green in Europe and a lot more green in North America and a little bit more green in other places as well. So they're recovering under protection. So what do we have for Ireland? Well, the earliest evidence, probably around 27 and a half thousand years from bone caves, many of which were excavated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, which is unfortunate because the bones have been preserved or so poorly preserved we cannot get genetic information from them. Um, the last wolf probably exterminated in 1786. So it's very likely that they were around for 40 or 50 or even 100,000 years in Ireland, but the earliest evidence only goes back 27 and a half thousand. They're the last major predator to be removed from the Irish landscape, 1786 most likely. And there is extensive evidence of their presence all over Ireland, but not systematically examined the source material the age of the evidence and language issues. And there's still a lot of material probably in Irish folklore that I've yet to even look at because my Irish isn't good enough. So as I said on the radio today when I did my KCLR interview, um, this wasn't a project that would easily fit for a postgraduate student or a short one or two year contract. This is one that I knew needed uh, to be dipped into over a long time period. And I've been at it now 25 or 30 years in that context. And really, I asked two very simple questions, or at least I thought they were simple questions when I started. I found out they weren't simple at all to try and answer them. Um, how common were wolves? Could I estimate population numbers even for one particular time period? Well, were they common or were they rare? Did they only occur, as most people would have thought, in the isolated mountain regions of Cork Kerry or maybe uh, up in, in Donegal or in Connemara or in the Wicklow Mountains? Or were they actually more widespread? And obviously, knowing that the last date is most likely 1786 for extermination, why were they gone so late? And in that context, wolves were gone from England, Scotland, and Wales prior to 1500. Although there are some late claims from the 1700s in Scotland, there are actually none of them stand up to any historical veracity. So they survived in Ireland for the best part of nearly 300 years longer than the rest of uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. So again, there's a big question there I want to answer. And some of the answers were easy to identify, but hard to prove. And some of them were hard to identify, but we'll work our way through some of them as well. So here's just some of the real characteristics. In fact, we've only got four wolf candidates, such as the scarcity of wolf bones in the archeological record. And also because we have to be super careful because domestic dogs obviously arrived in Ireland quite early as well. And we now know that domestication of dogs probably started as early as 20,000 years ago. Um, some recent findings. So that would indicate that potentially as long as humans have been in Ireland 11, 12,000 years, domestic dogs have been here, but also wolves have been here. So but to be super careful in terms of identification. So there are only four, unfortunately, um, carbon-14 dates for wolves. You've got Shandon Cave in County Wadford, 27,500 years. Castlepool Cave in County Cork, 23,000 years ago. Plunkett Cave in County Sligo, 11,000 years ago, and Elderbush Cave, Edenvale, County Clare, 1730 BP, so about 300 AD, give or take. Okay. And what we're talking about here, really, we're not talking about skeletons or even full bones. We're mostly talking about fragments, unfortunately. So, no idea really of the overall creature itself. But there's lots of other archaeological evidence. We know that. Um, so, a good example would be. Turon County Galway, a possible wolf bone turned up. Uh, ring forts 
were used for protection from humans and wolves at night. In modern day Eastern Europe, stock are brought into similar enclosure at night to protect them from wolves and bears, especially as part of summer transhumance. So transhumance is where you bring your animals up to the high pastures in the summertime in mountainous areas, and then you do the lowland grass areas for hay for the winter. And obviously once you bring them up into the wilds, and this happens in the Alps all the time, they're vulnerable to wolf and bear attacks. So typically they'd gather them into some sort of enclosure at nighttime and they'd stand watch with their guard dogs and with their shepherds as well. And even the Bond castles up to late medieval times, those low walls around castles enclosing typically maybe an acre or two were often used to protect cattle for fear of wolf attack and of course human attack because in the pre-colonial times, um, cattle raiding was one of the primary Irish sports and ways of life. So you always want to protect your, your, your major assets. So this is a good example. I haven't been able to find one from an Irish manuscript. But this is from a fantastic Welsh 13th century beastery. Now, beastery would be a Latin book that would a lord or lady would have, and it would be used to teach the children of the lord or lady how to speak Latin and how to read and write, because the other book that would be most common would be a Bible would be too complex for teaching young children how to read and write. Whereas a beastry generally would be a series of stories. And often it would be Bible stories, including Noah's Ark, but also things like Aesop's Tales as well. So much more approachable in terms of a learning curve. So this is a fantastic depiction. And I was delighted when I came across this. Um, what you have here is the classic. You have your enclosure. You have your wide awake sheep. Wide awake sheep. You have your shepherd who's asleep, who's going to be in trouble with his lord. You have clearly got his sheepdog is also asleep and very clearly here you have your wolf here and you can see it's a kind of a, a latinized version of canis lupus it's an old obviously medieval version of canis lupus here we identify this wolf with its teeth out its claws um exposed well but that's a very typical medieval depiction of a wolf and people were terrified of wolves because they were such a threat so that's the archaeological evidence. But in terms of one of the most fascinating areas, this is an area I had no expertise in, uh, apart from very superficially, was names. And names became a, a kind of an area I followed religiously. And there's still, I think, a lot of Irish names out there that haven't been properly translated that would help me. And they're probably all um, wolf-related. So Moctera, if you look up the Irish dictionary for wolf, you'll get Moctera, which literally translates to son of the country. It really means a, a rural or a, a wild creature. Interesting one is Faelku, the old manuscript F A E L means evil, and obviously Ku is hound. But there are actually lots of um, Irish surnames um, derived from Fael. So anybody who's a Fael on, wheeling or feeling, actually, oh yeah, there we are. Interesting area I kind of explored, and these are typical damp Irish wolf. It's common one era, which is temporary in the country, obviously it means a wild foil evil or hound or evil hound. And anybody with the surname of foil on feeling or wheeling actually has a foil component. Like all uh, in, or all means wild, so wild dog, wild hound, etc. Various versions, and then some probably older ones which don't really appear in the place names. Lay down in and howl or scream are very. If you don't, you can add their other wolf away in place names that contain hound and con. Which is now used for purposes, but the etymology of them has yet to be formally identified. So, in terms of Brague, I'm up to about 38 or 39 place names. So, typical examples would be Braggy, Woolfield or Plain, Brague on Teen, Woolfield of the Fairy Hill, Care Break, Four to the Wolves. There's also about 12 or 13 with Mock Tira. So this is an example, East of Moctera. These are all town and names predominantly. Water of the Wolves, or Knockon, Small Hill of the Wolves. And there's even a couple of Fuel ones. Felburn Hill, actually, in County is actually Wolf Hill. 
if you were to translate it, believe it or not. But you have to go back to the old story of the names as well. So this is the distribution. Unfortunately, Carlo is yet to find a Carlo place name with wolves in it, which kind of surprises me given its proximity to Mount Leinster and an obvious uh, a lot of wolves in the area at, at, at various points over the history. Clare remarkable in them. As you can see, Donegal, Donegal had plenty of place names, but no actual documentary records. So they must be up there somewhere. You can see there's quite a few for Wexford and a lot of them are mock tier ones, which is interesting. I'll show you some examples in a minute and various other ones going down uh, through the list. So most counties, counties are represented and especially if you add in the one which would be mostly associated with the plantation counties, north, so you've got Antrim, Armagh, Fermanagh, Free, Cork, Down, Leash and Offaly, of course, King examples from County Wexford. So Glen Tira near Enniscorthy, actually in Irish is Clune Vic Tira, which means Meadow of the Wolf. Two parish North, North County. County Wexford is actually the footer, which means that the wolves. And you can see there are other ones as well. So hidden away in the Irish place names is actually reference to wolves. But you have to be super careful. And all of these I got to as Irish as well, just to be absolutely sure I wasn't fooling myself. This is the earliest depiction we have of a wolf in Ireland. It's also uh, an error, the earliest known bit of book vandalism in Ireland, because you see here, we notice the wolf from the. He has gone along, estimated several hundred years later, and has added in this little fork tail at the end to show that the wolves are evil. And one of the suggested reasons for this is obviously Ireland had no snakes, but did have wolves. So sometimes the stories about snakes are kind of translated into versions with wolves instead of snakes because people associate wolves with evil. There's a huge amount of folklore evidence and other evidence from uh, going back to even the first millennia AD. So for example, most Irish saints seem to have some encounter with wolves. Saint Quaveen and Saint Maydog were said to have fed starving wolves in their flocks. And this actually, to some extent, is part of uh, the idea that the saints were able to negotiate with the devil, because the wolves are seen as, in a sense, as being representative of the devil in Ireland, in some respects. Yeah. And uh, it also comes from St. Francis of Assisi, who also had a, a, famous, a famous Italian wolf as well. Uh, the Brehan Laws have a series of various, um, described as only three wild animals that are kept taken as pets. Any committed offence committed by the pet wolf were to be charged at the same rate as the domestic dog, including the attacks on humans and domestic animals. They were used in charms and cures, and these are very bizarre. Hanging away, whereas more bizarrely, eating a dish of wolf meat would prevent a person from seeing ghosts. I think I'd rather see the ghosts. And even more bizarrely and terrifyingly, sleeping with a wolf's head under the pillow will ward off nightmares. Well, we know that's an entirely effective treatment because, of course, the size of a wolf's head, if you put that under your pillow, you're not going to sleep anyway. So you have to sleep to have nightmares. It's in a very effective cure for that. Um, can't even imagine what the smell would be like. There's even modern folklore. And there's a custom in the Gate Cemetery, Ogunlaw and Killaloo in County Kildare, and actually also across the Shannon in parts of North Tipperary, in some of the older cemetery, old graveyards, where they're now typically in fields, the mourners would place the coffin on the ground uh, at the four cardinal points. And the idea was that it would disperse the scent and the wolves would be able to disinter the corpses and eat them. In Scotland, they used to bury them on islands in little stone tombs for the same reason. There was also Many stories about the Irish as werewolves, and some of these were obviously propagated by the colonials in an attempt to kind of dehumanize Irish. So, for example, all the people of Austria were able to change themselves into wolves, but they were not true werewolves as the only attached animals and not humans. And in fact, this werewolf stuff kind of fascinated me, and I'm going to explore this a little further. 
Here's another example of some early depiction of wolves in Ireland. This is from the first known tourist to Ireland. This is Geraldus Cambrensis, who wrote the history and topography of Ireland around 1200 AD. Spectacularly right in some descriptions and also spectacularly wrong. And you can see here the wolves are depicted, one with a saint, um, very stylized, very hard to tell anything about them. Obviously, we're familiar with wolves in fairy stories. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood is the one that springs to mind, but it's a very common motif for stories of this nature across not just Europe, but many parts of the world as well. And some of them even go back to Aesop's Tales in Greece. Um, and there are actually over two dozen stories with wolves in them in Aesop's Tales, if you look at the full list of several hundred stories that have actually survived. The moral of all these stories generally with wolves is that, of course, don't talk to strangers and don't stray into the woods. So they're really stories instructing children about how to behave and be careful. And of course, in medieval times when Europe was dominated by large oak woods, uh, wolves were very common as well and potentially easily take uh, young children as, as, as prey. There's also some more interesting depictions. On the left here, we have from a 13th century Irish manuscript, a priest or an Irish saint negotiating with a wolf and then converting it from a werewolf back into human by giving it the sacrament. Okay, so the idea of werewolves goes back even to pre-colonial times to some extent. And remarkably, um, and I came across this now in Greece, in Greece there's actually a, a, a whole series of depictions of Greek saints, and particularly St. Christopher, as being dog-headed. And this is a typical depiction here in the center, which is very peculiar, as you can imagine. And, and obviously this feasts on the idea of, of werewolves being in, actually in existence. But there are other aspects as well. There are actually a whole series of medical conditions that help give rise to the werewolf myth. Uh, the first of these is uh, hypertrichosis, which is a, it's a werewolf syndrome. It's, it's actually a hormonal disease. And it's the excessive hairiness, especially all over the face. And here on the right-hand side, we have a picture of uh, Petrus Gonzalez, 1648, the first recorded case of hypertrichosis. And actually had about eight or nine children, male and female, half of which had the disease and half didn't. You also have a very peculiar disease called lycanthropy. And this is actually a psychiatric disease um, where sufferers believe that they have been transformed into an animal and behave as such. Typically, 40% of the cases think they've become wolves. Now, in individual cases, this is associated with obviously a, a psychiatric breakdown. But in fact, there were outbreaks of these in medieval villages in places like France uh, and Belgium and other parts of Europe during the Little Ice Age. And what we think happened here is that um, because the grain was harvested when weather conditions were really bad, the grain was saturated and too wet. When it was taken to miller to be stored and eventually to be processed, it actually developed fungus called ergot. And the ergot then would have been transferred into the bread, which all the people in the village would have ate from the one uh, miller and probably the one baker as well. And this ergot actually fungus is highly hallucinogenic. So it's quite likely that these mass outbreaks were associated with ergot poisoning. Uh, and also obviously the modern condition of lupus, in particular extreme sensitivity to light as well. Uh, and uh, so that these are medical issues that would give rise to the werewolf myth itself. But moving away from that now, and you've got another example here, Stephen Dubrovsky from the 20th century, spent most of his life sadly working in a freak show in America, but probably made a reasonable living out of it. Um, we've also got to think when we talk about medieval documentary records, just how poor natural history was understood. So for example, when the first giraffe was brought into the Europe, to the, the Medici's, they tried to feed it meat because they thought it was some sort of a carnivore. Okay, so this, uh, I was giving a talk on wolves and wolf numbers in a European conference um, I think it was near Paris, actually, about 10 years ago. And a German um, natural historian came up and he said, uh, have you seen this uh, depiction of a creature in Ireland roaming around killing people? And I said, no. And he showed me this incredible image. And it shows you that obviously, clearly, it's 
a mixture of a camel and a man, but also um, possibly something else as well. And it shows you attacking and eating humans as well. And it shows you just how poorly understood um, natural history was, even in the 1600s, 1700s. It's only really from the 1700s onwards that we start to grasp um, what natural history is all about and what animals and, and creatures are all about. As we were gathered and collected from all over the globe, sadly, most of them in, in, in barrels of wine and brandy to preserve the skins. I suppose more importantly now for me, in terms of asking my key questions, was to look at specifically dated and recorded um, wolf instance in the documentary records. This really I knew was going to be my major database because this exactly was, they were, I had a year or time period. I also had a place. Sometimes not as clear cut in both cases, but nevertheless, it gave me an idea of where wolves were and how often they occurred in a particular location, at least an inkling. So what type of documentary evidence? Well, the monastic annals, for example, the annals of Connacht for 1420 state that many persons were killed by wolves. In the 1690s, Rory Cara was implied to hunt wolves in County Down, where wolves were described as a great plague. Okay, letters and diaries, 1601, Richard Boyle, Earl of Cork stated, the place where abandoned bridges situated upon a great district of the country was in the last 24 years a mere waste, bog and wood, serving as a retreat and harbour to wood kerns, rebels, thieves and wolves. And yet now, God be praised, as civil a plantation as most in England. Other examples, little stories that are hard to verify. This is from the Irish Perny Journal from 1841. Somebody in Wexford remembers wolves being killed uh, probably 1730, 1740. And of course, those are the last wolves. So when they were commonplace, there was every attempt made to exterminate them. And I'll talk about that later on. But when they became very scarce, it was almost like a, per a perverse idea of the last wolf in County Tipperary, the last wolf in Munster, the last wolf in Ireland. And there was loads of claims starting in the 1730s for the last wolf in Ireland. But the one I'm most comfortable with is 1786 on Mount Leinster under Wexford Carlow, border by John Watson, master of the hounds at Michel near Ballydarton, County Carlow. And the wolf was killed by his wolfhounds. According to his daughter, the wolf was killing sheep and was hunted down and killed by them and he was killed near a stream. And that's probably the one I'm most comfortable with as the last one. If it's not right, they were certainly around in the 1770s. I have claims up to the 1830s, but none of them seem to go back further than about 40 or 50 years from now. So more than likely, they're kind of modern stories. There may be a germ of truth in them, but it's very hard to clearly identify uh, genuinely where the last wolf was. And even if 1786 was right, it was possible there might have been one or two isolated wolves left somewhere in the country, but obviously would have died off because breeding populations were gone. Okay, so one of the things I plotted was the distribution of the wolves by category. So if we start at the earliest one, we have evidence of the export of wolf skins from Ireland, a small but lucrative trade going to Bristol predominantly of wolf skins, and they were the most expensive skin skins being exported from Ireland and were often uh, three or four times that of things like otters and pine martens. So they would have been a luxury item and they were probably for robes of state and for high people, bishops, lords, ladies, earls, dukes, etc. Then there's evidence of most commonly wolf attack on domestic animals. So typically sheep, Rarely horses, rarely cattle. Um, there's also bounties, a few bounties, acts of legislation. Wolf hunting, records of wolf hunting and what was required and just the observation of them. Simply mentioning, excuse me, a wolf was spotted in my local area. And some of the earlier ones of these 1500s and 1600s are very matter of fact, as if this was a normal or a fairly normal occurrence. They weren't as if, oh, it's unbelievable, we actually have a wolf in the area. Like, oh, we had a wolf in the area, it's attacked sheep, we need to sort this out. So there were very much more kind of normal, more routine observations. And the smallest category here, as you can see in red, 
is wolf killing humans or eating corpses. And there's only about four or five references, predominantly associated with attacks on injured soldiers after battles, the Battle of Kinsale being one, and the taking of children during famine times or orphan children during famine times. There's a couple of references to that. But generally speaking, wolves, even in a modern day environment, will not go near humans. And then at the end here in, in the dark blue, navy blue, you can see the claims for the last wolves. From 1700s onwards, the last wolf in Carlo, the last wolf here, the last wolf there as well. And eventually they fade out. And this diagram is, needs to be updated. There's probably another eight or 10 events to go in there, but the pattern is pretty much the same. This is another depiction. This is a colonial depiction. Uh, this is a defeated rebel in the wool in the forest. Uh, with wolves for background, you can see the wolves here as well, and they're identified by the text. And this is a typical Irish cloak or mantle here. And this is the typical, uh, I suppose, retreat of wolves and, and, and rebels into the wolves, into the wild. Uh, very much like Robin Hood in Nottingham as well. This is from the 16th century. So I, I was very lucky when uh, the first atlas of Irish mammals Uh, came out. Um, that uh, as part of that, the Irish mammals from the Waterford uh, National Biodiversity Centre, they wanted uh, uh, two pages on wolves as part of the species because obviously they were only gone from the 1700s, late 1700s. So what you have here is the map that was produced. So these are um, spatially located and dated as much as possible wolf events or wolf records in Ireland from the documentary evidence. And you can see here, there's a fairly good distribution all over um, most of Ireland, whether they're in the gray areas or in clusters, or in pink where there's one-off recordings. The only area they don't seem to be is in the big bog areas in the central part of Ireland. And this is very much the case um, in terms of the document record. So they were widespread all, all over Ireland with the exception of a few central areas. And as you can see here, cities were no problem. They were recorded extensively around Dublin, probably coming down from the Wicklow Mountains. They were even hunted in Kilmainham um, that'll tell you how close the wolves got to the city, and obviously Cork as well. And even today in Eastern Europe, uh, wolves occasionally come into cities in places like Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, to scavenge at night time. So the urban wolf, just say we have the urban fox, in medieval times certainly would have been, uh, people would have been well aware of that as well. Uh, so again, I'm adding to these maps all the time as time has gone on. This is 2017, so there will be a few additional dates really to be put onto this. Okay, so in terms of wolf numbers, this is a real challenge. Clearly there were no surveys, there was no data available. So I looked at, from this fantastic book by Joy McCracken, Irish Woods and Tudor Times, where she estimated the land cover of Ireland at around 12.5% uh, native oak woodland and about another 10 or 12% effectively semi-wild to wild areas with scrub woodland. And based on this work and typical wolf ranges in Europe, an estimate of 400 to 800 wolves would not be impossible in this context throughout AD 1600. More crucial information comes from the bounty payments associated with the Cromwellian government. And there's a partial bounty payment in AD 1655 or 1665. The, the, the five or six is smudged so badly, it's impossible to read, of 243 pounds, five shillings and fourpence. But this is just for the counties of Galway, Mayo, Sligo and part of Leitrim. So an estimate for that part of the country was this bounty would represent between 75 and 150 wolf kills. There's an overall bounty payment from 1649 to 1656 of a huge amount of money for the time, £3,847, five shillings, which would give uh, an average over the seven and a half years of £513, representing two to 400 wolf kills per annum. But the population doesn't seem to be impacted too much by this. 
So we're probably looking at four to 800 wolves to sustain the levels of loss. In fact, it's noted that um, after major wars and famines, uh, when human populations went down, wolf populations recovered. And also the export of wolf skins from Ireland to Bristol in the 1500s. So, coming up towards the end now, one of the big questions was, why were they gone? How did they survive to 1786? And what were the factors that changed that made them uh, go ex exterminate in Ireland probably by 1786 or certainly 1770 or 1770s? Well, the first one, of course, is that if you go back to medieval times, as I said with McCracken's work, Ireland would still had vast tracts of native oak forest. It had lightly populated mountain and, and scrub forest areas, ideal for wolves. So deforestation was a huge factor. And Ireland went from 1600, probably 12.5% woodland cover to 2.5% by 1700. So we lost all our native oak forest. There was land drainage, the creation of agricultural land, also large walled estates were created. So the, the, in a sense, the shiring of Ireland, particularly in the big plantation counties, Leash, Offaly, uh, parts of Cork, parts of the North, etc. The population change was generally rising, with the exception of periods after Cromwellian and William White Wars in the mid 1600s and late 1600s or late 1500s. But very importantly, I think, was the bounties legislation brought in by the Cromwellian government. So, and these amounts were vast. It's hard to make a judgment on what amount we're looking for, but these would be in the order of thousands, tens of thousands of pounds or euros in a contemporary environment. So for a female, six pounds, a male, five pounds, hunting juvenile, three pounds, cubs, 10 shillings. And they would have been hunted out pack by pack. So each bounty for a pack would probably be a mixture of all these. They were brought in professional wolf hunters. So Captain Edward Pierce, who was one of Cromwellian's uh, right-hand men, was granted land in County Mead, and he had to destroy 14 wolves over five years or forfeit £100 annually. And he clearly would not have taken on that land unless he was able to meet those requirements. And there was actually a list of other species as well. He was supposed to take out a certain number of them as well. So there was quite a few of these professional wolf hunters one or two of them were, were, were definitely dodgy characters, were looking for uh, lots of money to do very little as well. There's also an attitudinal issue here that was very much a changeover as a result of the plantations. So the native Irish really, if you read the, carefully the Brehan laws, they saw them as part of the landscape. They had to be hunted on occasion and some native lords even kept wolves as pets. So basically the, the native Irish prior to plantation would have controlled the numbers, but not certainly any indication they set out to exterminate them completely. The plantation settlers viewed them as vermin and had to be exterminated from the landscape as quickly as possible. And in many respects, plantation settlers had really been duped into coming to Ireland. They were told that there was plenty of cleared land available. That wasn't the case or cleared good land. They were told that the natives were friendly. We certainly weren't. They were also told that wolves were extremely rare in Ireland and that stories of wolves were, were, were exaggerated. And this wasn't the case at all. In fact, one or two plantation settlers writing back to the UK described Ireland as wolf land, uh, not Ireland at all. So they were kind of sold, um, really, it was a, a tourist brochure or a settler brochure that really wasn't speaking the truth at all. And many left within 20 or 30 years of arriving into Ireland, or sometimes earlier. When it comes to depiction of wolves in Ireland, we're very, very limited in data. There are lots of these typical, this is a typical carving, and there are many on monasteries throughout Ireland and other, other buildings, but they're so stylized, it's impossible to tell what they are. So this is a stone carving from Arna Glass Castle. It's actually, I think, in the National Museum. It's supposed to be showing the last wolf being uh, attacked and killed by a dog in the 17th century. Hard to tell which is the dog, which is the wolf. But in fact, the carving is probably 14th century. And this is very typical of 
kind of stylized depictions, including the Book of Kells as well. So effectively, what would have happened with wolves is that they would have become isolated in pockets as the hunting and the landscape and the settlement patterns changed. Each pocket would have been eliminated or would have naturally bred out of existence and eventually would be down to a very small number of individuals, possibly in one or two locations. And at that stage, their extermination was, was inevitable because there, there wasn't a viable breeding population. And this is what happens today with, with species as well. When the species number gets down to a certain number of individuals, typically less than 20 or 25, they become known as ghost species because extinction is, is almost inevitable, even with modern day technology. So one of the questions I'm often asked is reintroduction. And, and certainly um, when the Green Party chairman, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, mentioned it in the doll about reintroducing wolves. It certainly got a lot more airtime. And it, it, it's a balance, really, of, of trying to think about this issue. Firstly, of course, on the positive side, you have the fact that these are a part of our natural and cultural history. And relatively speaking, they're only recently gone and were deliberately exterminated by humans. So therefore, maybe there's a moral imperative for us to bring them back as part of our landscape. There's talks about them controlling deer populations but we'd really have to have substantial wolf population to even do that. So that's one sequence of arguments. There are other more challenging ones on the reintroduction side. Firstly, of course, even going back to 1786, the landscape and habitat of Ireland is very different to when last wolves were around. We don't have large wilderness areas anymore. We don't have areas where there are not human populations. So, in a sense, would wolves be able to survive in the landscape of Ireland today without real heavy conflict with humans? The answer is probably no. We also wouldn't be introducing just a wolf pack into Ireland because there need to be a viable genetic population. So you're probably looking realistically at three or four packs of wolves, maybe as many as 50 adults from different genetic backgrounds. To, in order to generate a viable population. The problem with that is that under protection, wolves typically can double population numbers every single year. So we could have a scenario where we could spend a huge amount of money introducing wolves only for five years later, having to actually have a call on a regular basis, which actually happens to some extent in some Scandinavian countries. Public attitudes would obviously have to change enormously. And we've seen this actually with the reintroduction of our native eagle species, the challenges that were faced and are being overcome slowly but surely. But we're now going probably a scale higher in terms of uh, acceptance because we're now moving from a bird species that would not be, ever be perceived to be a threat to human and really not a threat to the vast majority of domesticated animals or sheep. Uh, eagles do take the afterbirth for lambs of lambs and dead lambs, but not living lambs. Um, now we're talking about a large land-based predator that occurs in packs. That's a very different set of mindset. And, you know, public attitude would take a long time to change. And as true the studies have shown that where people actually live in Africa, Southeast Asia, another part of the world with large predators, generally they have developed strategies and ideas for working with them. Yes, there are conflicts and occasionally there are, there are instances as well. But there's a kind of an acceptance of their existence. But once they lose that, once you lose that population and lose that connection, then it's very difficult and almost impossible to get it back. So it would be an extensive cost, changing attitudes, reintroduction costs, compensation scheme for farm animal losses, long-term protection costs. And that would be the, the standard scientific way of doing it. But as, as a person pointed out to me in in a talk I gave uh, in Cork a couple of years ago, why not just bring in a pack and let them loose in Wicklow or let them loose in, in, in the Cork Kerry Mountains and see what happens. And, and, and that's a very interesting idea as well. Um, what would actually happen? Uh, also, worryingly, and I have records and evidence of wolves in private collections and certainly wolf cross dogs as well, which I am actually utterly opposed to. Um, they are very high risk species. 
And these are generally held by people who do not understand the difference between a tame individual and a domesticated animal. And in the USA, where they have logs of these and studies carried out, um, wolf cross dogs and so-called tame or humanized wolves have a responsible for multiple children deaths and horrific injuries. Even when the animal has been raised from a pup in the family background that they're in. And this is because they are still wild animals, genetically speaking. So we really need to be very careful about that. So wolves are best in the wild or worst case scenario in some sort of a animal park or zoo. At the moment, my view is that we're really not in a position to reintroduce them, but it's certainly something we should be thinking about in the long term. So just some final comments. A unique part of the cultural and natural landscape only late lost. Probably more than a thousand wolves in Ireland around AD 1600 and would have diminished gradually over that time period with a few little blips. They were very widespread and people are used to having them around. Most people probably never saw wolf and even today I've tried seeing wolves in the wild on several occasions in Canada and various other parts, never seen them in the wild. They shy away from humans but you might hear them on a clear night when their voices carry much further. The last likely date, 1786, Mount Leinster County is Carlow and Wexford. There was discussion about five years ago or six years ago of the new Habitats Directive uh, being brought in, which would force countries to reintroduce species that had been exterminated in the last 500 years. And this obviously would be wolves for Ireland. Um, this hasn't happened. And I'm delighted because I probably would end up on some goddamn awful government committee for the rest of my days dealing with this issue, which would be a shame. Very much missing what they look like. Uh, and this is one of the big problems. There doesn't seem to be any, what I describe as anatomically correct drawings or paintings of wolves. There are no detailed written descriptions. This would be the case, obviously, because when you said somebody about a cat, you don't describe a cat because you know when somebody knows a cat. The same be true of a wolf in medieval times. People would know what a wolf was, so they weren't going to write down what a wolf was. And also because they were gone in the late 1700s and the Victorians hadn't gotten around to stuffing and killing large numbers of them, we don't have any stuffed specimens either. There's a few little bits and pieces in the Natural History Museum stores in Dublin, but nothing of any significant nature. And one of the things I, I would love to get would be, and I hope in some old house or building in Ireland that there's a wolf skull from the medieval time period, would be to get a DNA analysis because wolves were isolated in Ireland for probably 12 to 15,000 years. It's very likely at worst that they had become a distinctive subspecies and possibly even a species in its own right. It's not beyond the realms of possibility because there's a little hint in the descriptions that the Irish wolf seems to be bigger than the European counterpart. It's only hinted at in the few kind of half descriptions that are there. Um, so it's quite possible that they were very distinctive. And that'd be very interesting, but DNA specimens would be required for that. So, that finishes my talk. It's based on Wolves in Ireland and Natural and Cultural History. Uh, normally I'd have a few books for sale and I'd get to meet and chat with you, but obviously that's not possible. But it is available in paperback from Four Quartz Press. And I think they're charging, and it's now 13 or 15 euro for them. So thank you very much for that. And I hope everybody's had a chance to listen to me for that. Okay, thank you. Kieran, thanks very, very much. Um, that has been an excellent lecture in scope Did that in work out okay it worked out grand in scope and detail it's really been and i think an eye opener for a lot of us um what i've asked people to do if you have questions put them in the chat we'll pick them out of the chat and we'll ask her if he's able to answer them um and i'll just go straight to yeah, the fire questions away. the questions we currently have in um and the first one is from a john watson and he said that the um the, t the idea of the wolf being ripped apart by the wolfhounds uh, is unlikely because there's a portrait of the famous John Watson in the RDS with a map made of the pelt at his feet. So more likely to be you know, not torn apart mm -hmm. by um, wolfhounds. Um, the... Yeah, I, I, and there is, there, there is actually a big issue with Irish wolfhounds as well. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm very um, I'm very controversial about this, but it looks like there was three versions, and I would describe the ones as an Irish wolfdog. The modern day Irish wolfhound is probably a Victorian recreation, and a typical wolfdog, if you look at in the medieval description going back further, would be uh, shorter and much heavier. And I think if you're going to be fighting a big, heavy wolf, you need a big, heavy dog to do that, and not a hound. I think the wolfhound would be more like a, a, a coursing type species, maybe to chase them out into the open, but you need heavier dogs to bring them down. In fact, the few descriptions of wolf hunting, the packs of dogs used, it was always a mixture of fast dogs, but also heavy dogs. Okay, um, the next question we have is, are you aware of any unique characteristics of Irish wolves in comparison to those found in other regions? And I think you've probably dealt with that in, in the talk. But if you want yeah, to the evidence. Yeah, just the end of the talk there, I did suggest that there might be at subspecies level, because bear in mind, they would have been isolated on Ireland for probably 12 to 15,000 years. And we do know from North America, from the genetic work to be done, they had about 12 or 13 subspecies. Um, so it's very likely there were subspecies species because they would have been genetically different so I don't know because we don't have really a medieval bone fragment or tooth or skull to do a genetic analysis on okay. but the suggestions in the literature are the only suggestions that they might be a bit bigger than the typical European wolf okay the next question we have have there been any sightings of one-off wolves around the world i.e. rare species or new species recently Well, wolves are very interesting and many of them have been collared in Europe and they do travel enormous distances. Um, uh, more recently, I saw an example of a wolf that had gone from the Apennines in the middle of Italy and ended up on the, uh, the western side of the Alps in France, in southern France, in three months. So they can travel long distances. This is one of the issues with reintroduction is you could put a pack down in County Wicklow, but they could be in Galway in two days. So they do travel long distance and ro lone wolves have been spotted very far away from populations in North America. Okay. Um, information point, Balak Castle um, has the last wolf in Connacht, sorry, the last wolf shot in Connacht in its basement, stuffed. So there you go, it might be where you might get some DNA. Um, again, just comments. Right. Where, where was this? Sorry, it says it's in the comments there. B A L L E E K Castle has the last wolf shot in Connacht in the basement, stuffed. <clears throat> okay, Is this again, a hotel by any chance? I don't know. Um, if that person might come back to us, um, handle might be. Um, Again, some uncommon about Wolf Hill and County Leash um, and that area linked with wolves. Um, yes. Again, again, to what extent yeah, have Wolf wolves... Hill and the, the wolf trap. Yeah. Uh, to what extent have wolves came on, back in Western Europe in the last 20 years? Yeah, they've been, they've been migrating westwards. Uh, so they were gone from Germany, they've been gone from Belgium, gone from Luxembourg. Um, they've been migrating westwards and they're actually touching now the North Sea coastline. So they've migrated out of the heartland of the Alpine region and are migrating westwards. And arguably, um, they're superb swimmers. They could swim to England, travel across England. They could swim from the Mull of Kintyre to Northern Ireland, no problem at all, a whole pack of them. So arguably, you know, this is obviously fancy. They could actually reintroduce themselves. It's extremely unlikely, of course, but certainly in mainland Europe, uh, there is no issue with them traveling and reintroducing themselves all over the place. Uh, humans being the biggest challenge. Okay, thank you. So things like railway lines, motorways don't seem to present a big problem. Okay, um, the answer to that castle, the castles in County Mayo. So that's the person who came back to us on that. Um, again, someone's been asking about the possibility of me listening back to the next presentation. It has been recorded. It generally is our intention that people, if you go onto the carnhistorical.com website, we actually do the podcast there and yeah, it will be there in, in, in the near future. Um, 
Yeah. Do, do. Um, again, there's a question then, for what reason did the Irish kill off all their wolves? And again, I think we've answered that during the lecture. So I think we can deal with that. Um, yeah. Do, do, do. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Ballet Castle is in Ballina, County Mayo. It is a hotel, but have a small museum in the basement. Uh, mostly weapons, but they have some stuff that have stuffed yeah. wolf and some fossils. I, I've, I've dealt with, I've followed up. I, yeah, I've followed up a few of these and actually they all turned out to be kind of more touristy attraction type events as okay. opposed to genuine stuffed specimens. Uh, the issue with anything stuffed prior to about 1890 or 1900, and I know there's some Nigel Monaghan in the Natural History Museum in Dublin, is that most of them would be highly toxic. And that's why a lot of their older specimens aren't on display because they would have to use things like lead and arsenic as part of the, um, the process. So if they're on public display and in good condition, it's very likely they're contemporary or near contemporary and probably from somewhere like Alaska who export um, wolf skins and wolf, stuffed wolf specimens. Okay. I'll do, one, I'll do one last question because I'm conscious of the time. Um, and it just says, considering the problems uh, reintroducing of raptors, illegal killing by shooting boys, like how strict could legislation yes. um, be if wolves were ever introduced? Oh, I think I think we'd have to be we really have to be hardcore. Um, I think all introduced wolves would have to be radio collared. I think they'd have to be dedicated protection teams. Um, it would be a very very serious undertaking. Um, in that sense, um, and and we're certainly not ready for it yet by any means. Okay, Kieran, thank you very much. Um, I'm as usual with normal customary to have mm -hmm. a vote of thanks proposed by one of our members. So I'm going to hand over to our vice president, uh, Richard Codd, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Podrick. Um, Kieran, you've given us the most interesting lecture on wolves in Ireland. It was an excellent presentation, and, and the slides were the slides were great. And you also added some humour into the presentation, and uh, absolutely most interesting. Um, Thank you. I'm very familiar with the General Fenna area at the foothills of Mount Leinster, and with the sculpture which is in in the wall there opposite All Saints Church in Fenna. Uh, but that's a fairly recent uh, uh, sculpture. Uh, so on behalf of Carlow Historic mm -hmm. Archaeological Society, I would like to thank you, Kieran, for giving us this most interesting and excellent lecture on wolves in Ireland. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. Um, thank you indeed. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks for the opportunity. OK. Um, just to remind everyone, as we would at normal lectures, uh, people's membership is again due, it's now 2021. Um, it's 15 euros for membership of the society. Um, if you go onto our website, you'll find the numerous ways which you can pay it online, by PayPal, by standing order and whatever. Um, again, our next lectures, uh, the lectures are held on the third Wednesday normally of the month. Um, so the next lecture will be due on the 17th of February. Um, it, we have penciled in, it's about the Knights Hospitaller of St. John in Carlow in South Leinster in the 12th to the 21st centuries. Um, we are looking at a possible change there to deal with um, the Irish in Spanish and Austrian uh, statecraft, uh, 1600s, 1900s, but we'll get back and it'll be on our website again, the details of that. Um, just in general, that has been um, for our second online lecture we hit the max, maxes we can take is 100. We hit 98 and we were pushing the edges on, on the 100. So it has been a very popular lecture. Thanks to all the participants who uh, attended um, and we'll welcome you back at other lectures in the future. So thank you again. Good night. All right, thank you. Kieran, I think if you're still on and you're looking at the chat, you'll actually realise how well this lecture has gone down from the comments that are in the chat. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll have a quick look it, at the chat now. Thank you. It, it, it's, it's one of those nights where um, 
you know, we have a huge number of comments in the chat, mainly thanking you for uh, the level uh, of Good. expertise and everything else on that. So, um, you know, it's one of these, you know, we, we, as I That's said, great. lectures, le lectures with us, um, you know, 